So a little note for uh, you, Aaron. Uh, I'm sorry, but my iPad is not connecting to the laptop again, and so you're going to have to advance the slides as we go along. But before we get into the actual sermon, I wanted to close up our congregational prayer time with this little, uh, this little prayer also, uh, a beautiful little poem uh, from George Herbert. Thou that has given so much to me, give one thing more, a grateful heart, not thankful when it pleaseth me, as if thy blessings had fair days, but such a heart whose pulse may be thy praise. May our pulses beat thy praise, O God. Now our first passage this morning, as we read already, is this passage from Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19. Now it's obvious that this is about gratitude in a lot of ways. So let's remind ourselves again what this passage says. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The word of the Lord. Amen. There are a few things that we need to notice here this morning for sure in this little story. One of them is that Jesus talks about how this foreigner has returned to give him praise. A and that is significant not because Jesus had a low un, or a low appreciation for Samaritans. You could not say that Jesus was a racist. Indeed, he evidenced on numerous occasions that, that he, he loved people of all kinds and all backgrounds. There are numerous times where he chose to travel through Samaria when he could have gone a shorter direction through Israel, through Palestine. And there are numerous incidences where Jesus spread healing among Samaritans, where he spoke kind words to people in Samaria, like the woman at the well, of course. A and, and so Jesus is not saying this because he has a low opinion of Samaritans. In fact, one of the key parables throughout the scriptures is the parable of the Good Samaritan, challenging everything that the, the Jewish people thought about their neighbors and their so-called enemies. Instead, Jesus is highlighting and challenging his disciples and the people around him about the way they view the Samaritan. Look, he says, this person who supposedly ought to be our enemy and supposedly is a kind of lesser human being is actually the only one who came back. But there's something further here, too. The Bible teaches us that when Jesus died for us, he died for us while we were still his enemy. Right? Jesus gave himself up for his enemy, us. We are, in a sense, 
like the Samaritan in this story. We were still foreign from God. God could have and should have seen us as his enemy because we had declared ourselves to be his enemy. But instead, God, our Heavenly Father, just like Jesus, His Son, He does not see us as enemies. Instead, He pours out mercy and grace and healing upon us. And so in this little statement where Jesus says, has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Jesus challenges our views of other people, people who are different than us, but also challenges our view of ourselves and says, look, when God is merciful to us, God is merciful to us even in spite of the fact that we were his enemy. But we also need to notice, of course, the gratitude of this foreigner. And remember for ourselves that we also need to be grateful. It is good and right to be grateful. But not only is it good and right to be grateful, it is very possible that the other nine were also grateful to have been cleansed. But it is also important, as this Samaritan illustrates, to do something about it. And that is a huge, important point for us in our culture today. Because everybody, seemingly, in Canada celebrates Thanksgiving to some degree or another. But, but as I heard on, on CBC News, The National, um, Ian Hannah Manson, right? Uh, we, we sometimes call him Ian Handsome Man-Thing because he's... <laughs> Pretty, pretty good-looking fellow. But anyways, he, he's there, and he's talking about Thanksgiving upcoming, and he says that Thanksgiving in his household is a secular event. I'm scratching my head. I'm thinking, what? How do you celebrate Thanksgiving without someone to give thanks to? How is that meaningful? But yet it's so common in this world that people celebrate Thanksgiving with this vague sort of, oh, I'm grateful, hooray. Grateful to whom? I don't know. I may be grateful about a lot of things, but I don't know to whom, and I don't do anything about it except for have turkey on Thanksgiving. Who cares? If that's what Thanksgiving means, that we're vaguely grateful to no one for the things that we have and we just have turkey, whatever. No thank you. Why bother? Instead, Jesus and this Samaritan make it clear that you need to be grateful to someone and you need to do something about it. Notice this this Samaritan man, he not only comes back to say thank you to God, or thank you to Jesus, he comes back praising God in a loud voice. Can you imagine? Let's say one of us, heaven forbid, but let's say one of us ends up with COVID. And we get it. And we become healed from it. Are you and I going to walk down the street of Athens praising God in a loud voice saying thank you to him? Thank you, God, for healing me from COVID-19. Thank you. Not in a, oh, I'm so holy, God healed me because I'm holy, but in a truly humble, grateful way? I don't know about you, but I'd be intimidated out of my mind to do
do something like that. But that is what this man does. And maybe, probably, almost definitely, we could take a page out of his book. See, because not only does God call us to be grateful, not only did God heal us when we were still his enemies, but God also taught us that it is important for us to show that gratitude in what we do in abundant ways. We are speaking of the harvest this morning, and our second passage is from 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 15. And it says this, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. And Paul is not talking just about money here. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gift to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, you, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace that God has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable, for his indescribable gift. The word of the Lord. Amen. Now, farmers, please put up your hands. Good. Yep. Okay, hold them up. Good. Now, tell me, have you ever starved to death? None of our farmers have starved to death. Do you know of any farmers in Athens, part of our congregation, who have starved to death? No. You worry. I think every year you worry, most of us. Some of you maybe not so much. And that's okay. I'm not judging or blaming you for that. I worry about things too. But God God gets you the harvest every year. And sometimes it's leaner and sometimes it's more difficult, but always it comes through somehow. And God cares for you. How much more is this true of the spiritual harvest of investing in the kingdom of God out of gratitude for what God has done. Crops may be bigger or smaller year after year, but investment and sowing and reaping in the kingdom of God only increases as we invest in the kingdom of God. Not only does it increase as in it builds our crown in heaven, but it also grows in terms of the gratitude that others have for us and for what God does, most of all. It increases the praise to God 
from all people when we serve out of gratitude for what God has done. Brothers and sisters, there's a little story that I wanted to share with you this morning called the Silver Crown. This is a traditional sort of story. And shall I be king? asked the child. And shall I wear a crown? You shall surely wear a crown, said the angel, and a kingdom is waiting for you. Oh, joy, said the child, but tell me, how will it come about? For now I am only a little child, and the crown would hardly stay on my curls. That I may not tell, said the angel. Only ride and run your best, for the way is long to your kingdom, and the time is short. So the child rode and ran his best, crossing hills and valleys, broad streams and foaming torrents. Here and there he saw people at work or at play, and on these he looked eagerly. Perhaps when they see me, he said, they will run to meet me and will crown me with a golden crown and lead me to their palace and throne me there as king. The folk were all busy with their tasks or their sport, and none of them heeded him, or left their business for him, and still he must fare forward alone. Also, he came across many travelers like himself, some coming toward him, others passing him by. On these two he looked earnestly and would stop, now one, now another, and question. Do you know, he asked, of any kingdom in these parts where the crown is ready and the folk wait for a king? Then one would laugh and another weep and another jeer, and all alike shook their heads. I am seeking crown and kingdom for myself, cried one. Is it likely that I can be finding one for you too? Another said, you seek in vain. There are no crowns, only fools' hats with asses' ears and bells that jingle in them. But others who had been longest on the way looked on him, some sadly, some kindly, and made no answer. And still he fared on. Now and then he stopped to help some poor soul who had fallen into trouble. And when he did, that the way lightened before him, and he felt the heart light within him. But at other times the hurry was strong on him, so that he would turn away his face and shut his ears to the cries that rang in them. And when he did that, the way darkened, and oftentimes he stumbled, and fell into pits and quagmires and must cry for help sometimes on those to whom he had refused it. By and by he forgot about the crown and the kingdom, or if he thought of them, it was but as a far-off gleam of dim gold, such as one sees at morning when the sun breaks through the mist. But still he knew that the way was long and the time short, and still he rode and ran his best. At last he was no longer a child, but an old and weary man. Just when his feet could carry him no farther, he looked up and saw that the way came to an end before him, and there was a gate and one in white sitting by who beckoned to him. Trembling yet glad, the old man drew near, and knew the angel who had spoken to him at the beginning. Welcome, said the angel. You come in good time. I came as fast as I could, said the man. But many things hindered me, and now I am weary and can go no further. But what did you find on the way, asked the angel. Oh, I found joy and sorrow, said the man, a good measure of both, but never a crown such as you promised me, and never a kingdom. But look, said the angel, you are wearing your crown. It is of the purest silver 
and shines like white cloud. And as for your kingdom, the name of it is heaven, and here is the entrance for you. Brothers and sisters, that story is not theologically perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it gives you that idea of investing in the kingdom of heaven. Someday, Lord willing, we will all be given crowns in heaven. We will be given these because we have invested in the kingdom of God here on earth. Brothers and sisters, let us be grateful. Let us be grateful for all that God has poured out upon us. And let us, like the Samaritan, do something about our gratitude. Let us proclaim God's praises loudly in the street. Let us serve the people around us. Let us serve our God and love Him, heart, mind, soul, and spirit. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for your gift to us. Thank you so much for so many things. Father, help us to honor you and praise you in all that we do. Out of grateful heart, for who you are and all you have done and will do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our song of repentance.